On April 1st, the, the government of Israel made a calculated decision to attack uh, an, uh, what they considered to be an enemy of their country, a, a leading general from the uh, Iran's Revolutionary Guard Corps, the IRGC, the Quds Force, as many call them. That turned out to be the 18th senior leader that Israel had assassinated since the war uh, with uh, Hamas had begun in October of, uh, of that year, of, of 2023. And now then, uh, they, they escalated the situation by not just taking them out, because the 17 that had preceded that were basically, uh, actually didn't hardly have much of an impact at all. This time, they chose to strike the target in the embassy, not on the way to the embassy, not on the way out from the embassy, but the most uh, emotional issue that you can have, because every nation considers its embassy as sovereign territory, no matter what country the thing is sitting in. And the, the norms of international relations of all countries, I mean, like the communist Chinese, the Soviet uh, Union back in the day, the, the hated North Korean regime, Libya, I, I mean, all the evil regimes, everyone has always recognized the sanctity of embassies, foreign embassies. No one crossed that line other than Al Qaeda in 1998 against the U.S. and now Israel against Iran. The question that we have to ask is what was the purpose? What was the intent of striking that target in the embassy as opposed to like they had done the previous 17 where they could have taken them out if they recognized them as a threat? but not done so in, a, in, a, in an above-board way that is guaranteed or it's likely, and let me not say guaranteed, to spark a response from Iran that could then be used as justification for more war. Now, some of the things are starting to line up that make me a little bit more worried about that, that that's actually what Israel has planned all along. And if they take this action, there is the very real possibility that America gets dragged into a war that we should never fight, that we don't want to fight, and that we will only lose if we do fight. I don't know if anybody has some fantasy in their mind that, quote, taking care of the Iranian problem once and for all is a good thing because that's not how it's going to work out. That's, it didn't how it worked out in Libya. It's not how it worked out in Iraq. It's not how it worked out by deposing the Taliban in Afghanistan. It always seems to come back on top of us. In fact, there's a long history of that, which we won't go into now. But if anybody thinks that, you know, trying to take out Iran is going to solve some problems, uh, the opposite is a virtual guarantee. And this, while I will come close to guaranteeing, will happen. It will be worse for us than whatever anybody imagines the current situation is. It can and almost certainly would get a lot worse if we actually went to war with Iran. So first of all, let's kind of get a running start here and let's take a look at some of the, the expected uh, cheerleaders in the United States. If there is uh, a response from Iran, which literally could come at any time, uh, it, it could even come later tonight, our time here in Washington, D.C., but any day now, something could happen. Uh, if that does happen, it appears that Israel is already poised to, to make a, a strong counterstrike. There's been news that they would consider, depending on the, the severity of an Iranian response, they could strike nuclear targets uh, on the on the Iranian regime in on the Iranian soil. They could, which of course itself is is by definition another act of war. We'll see what's going to happen. But first of all, let's take a look at at the expected support that Netanyahu could get for such an action in the United States. First of all, there's the mustachioed one, John Bolton. This is not. A Hamas war against Israel. This is not a Palestinian war against Israel. This is not an Arab war against Israel. This is an Iranian war against Israel through a number of surrogate terrorist organizations like Hamas, like the Houthis in Yemen, like Hezbollah in Lebanon and Syria, like the Shia militia groups in Iraq and, uh, and Syria. Uh, all, all of these are part of the ring of fire strategy that Iran has been creating over the years. And to treat Gaza as the conflict is in itself a mistake. And the administration simply will not point the finger of responsibility at Tehran, which is the epicenter of all this. Is it Iran that fired a, a missile at another country's embassy? Yeah, don't think so. Was it Iran that actually is having this catastrophic war in the Gaza Strip that has killed tens of thousands of innocent people. 
it's not. So to say that that's not the epicenter of this issue is either willful blindness uh, or lies, I guess, really. I don't know that there's a lot of other operations there because you can't literally ignore the elephant in the room and look for some mice around the edges and say that's actually the big issue there. No, it is the issue of the uh, war between Israel and Hamas and, and the proxy issue going on Hezbollah. Here's what John Bolton doesn't say, and, and all of these cheerleaders are going to be in the same boat here. They don't talk about the context, the things that go along. He points out the things that, as I pointed out the other day, many of these times there will be truthful information and accurate information, but it's selective information, and that's the case here. He's not telling you anything about why some of these things happen. As I just pointed out, 18 members uh, of the uh, Iranian regime of various levels have been assassinated by Israel since uh, since October of last year. So it's a concerted effort. And we're talking like they've knocked out, uh, Israel has knocked out uh, leaders in Baghdad, in, in Syria, in the, in the capital city there. Uh, they've actually attacked Syrian uh, um, soldiers, uh, taken out the airport. They've knocked out the airport uh, two or three times uh, over the, the span of time there. So they continue to take very provocative action anytime. Any nation takes an action against a, a party, that party, you can take the whole issue of morality out of it. You can take the right and wrong out of it because that's always in the eye of the beholder. It's a human issue. If one party is attacked and if their people are killed, they're going to respond. So all of these things keep going on and th these folks are responding in, in kind. And look, let me not paint any kind of a picture here that, that in any way says that Iran is a good actor. They aren't. They're definitely not. They're uh, they're a, a meddlesome, troublesome regime. They definitely do take part in, in terrorist activity and in supporting violent uh, Islamic regime or, or uh, groups throughout the Middle East. And they support Hezbollah. They support uh, the Houthis. There's a bunch of groups in both Iraq and, and, uh, and in Syria that they support without question. There's truth to that. And so this isn't whitewashing anything that they do. What this is doing is saying that it is not in America's interest to go to war over a meddlesome partner there. I'm sorry, not a partner, over a meddlesome actor in the Middle East. It's in America's interest to keep the lid on and to, to keep relative stability to it all possible, to keep the flow of, of energy sources open and available, the, the, the travel and the navigation of uh, uh, commerce, to keep all that stuff open. That's what our interest is. It is not seeking someone to go fight like people like John Bolton love to do, and, and they continue to keep trying. Uh, but now we let one of the actors that takes it a little bit higher is Jack Keane. He's a little bit more forceful even than John Bolton, as you see here. An attack on Iranian soil? Should that be part of the it plan? It should be. Well, of course it should be. Yeah, absolutely. We're not talking about a go to war attack on Iran that we've seen before when, when we lit up Baghdad. Nobody's advocating anything like that. When the administration says, well, we don't want to escalate, we don't want to widen the war, and no, no one wants a war with Iran, well, of course, no one's proposing a war with Iran. But holding around the carnival in terms of some of the IRGC assets, the leadership and their physical assets themselves, in a limited, measured way, makes sense and letting them know that we won't stop there. That That is asinine. And there's a lot stronger words I could use, but we'll leave it at that one for here. To suggest that you can go into another country and kill their senior leaders, to kill their military personnel and destroy their, their infrastructure of any capacity on the ground in a limited and measured way. Again, that's in the eye of the beholder. In, in Jack Keane's view, Sure, that's 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 everything is justifiable in his mind. So going and kill these people should back make them back down, and and it is beyond arrogant or, or naive. Take your pick to think that you can go in and you can kill Iranian people like that and take those kinds of actions, and that they're going to back down. I mean, have you paid any attention to the Middle East? Well, over centuries, forever, a thousand years, however, whatever time frame you want to use. That's not how it works over there. It's not how it works anywhere, really. Very few places actually back down. Almost nobody does. Usually they back up. And, and unless someone is physically outright wiped out and destroyed, if they're attacked, they're going to hit back in whatever means that they can. And there is 
at least theoretically, the possibility of, of, of a limited response. If something directly happens to you, then you can take limited action and say, look, I mean, this is actually valid to say because of what you did here, we're going to have this retaliation because you're not going to get to do this for free. Whatever you've done, there's a cost to pay for it. Here's what it is. Now, it's a punitive strike. This is not to teach you a lesson or anything else. This is not to make you back down or whatever. This is a punitive strike for what you did to us. If you don't do anything after that, then that's where it's going to stop right there. And we'll go back to having relative stability. I won't call it peace, but it is possible to have stability because some people don't want to have peace. And there's nothing you can do to make them have it. But you also have to be wise. You can't go in and hit stronger and to where the other side has no motivation to stop. And that's what we're doing right now. And you have comments like this from Jack Keane that said, yes, of course, we should go strike them. I, I mean, can anyone imagine a scenario? And I mean this. Think about this. Is there any scenario in your mind that the United States of America could be struck by any power for any reason, whatever they may hold? They may think that it's justified and reasonable, whatever. By definition, we won't. So if anyone strikes us that, that the leadership of our country would go, you know what? We had it coming. We shouldn't have done that. They're right. All right, boys, let's pack it up and go home. Let's let's don't do that again. I mean, it's laughable to even say it's it's it's, it's almost embarrassing to even say that out loud. Of course, that would never happen. But we expect others to do what we would never do. And again, we've hit Iran many times. We've hit Syria many times. And we've done it in ways that uh, I think are foolish and are laying the seeds for future problems. But a lot of it has been done at a relatively low threshold. And the issues didn't escalate further. The, the issue with Trump assassinating uh, Soleimani in uh, 2020 was a, is a big example of that because there was a big response from that. A hundred ballistic missiles on an American base in Iraq, which caused uh, many American troops to have serious uh, concussions. Thank God it didn't kill anybody, but it blew up a bunch of our buildings and hurt a bunch of our troops. But Trump decided not to escalate and literally, literally let it lie at that point, because that was in response to what we had done there. That could have gone sideways, but that also laid the groundwork for this hatred of the United States. And, and even after that period of time, after some number of months of delay, Iran went back again through their proxies to, to try and attack our, our troops that are pointlessly sitting on the ground in Syria and Iraq and in, and in other places in the region there. So there was there's continuing to be blowback from that. Even that issue is not completely gone. And then it just got breathed a whole new life when Israel attacked into uh, the Gaza Strip and started killing so many uh, innocent Palestinian people. And of course, as you know, we ended up losing some of our troops there as a direct response of what Israel had done. And, and of course, we have launched numerous uh, attacks into the Houthis in Yemen, uh, into these groups here in the Middle East. Uh, against uh, Khatib Hezbollah in, in Iraq and, and several other similar kinds of groups. Every time some of these things happen and Americans get killed or hit, we hit back there. What has it done? It, it, sometimes they delay, like they went on a, a, a pause after this the one of the last episodes, but then now then even those have started back again, and it'll always be that way. They'll take a tactical pause to let things cool down, and they'll come back because they're not going to stop doing this. So Keen's wrong. It's not going to deter them from doing anything, and it could very well spark a war. Now, if there's the biggest cheerleader and the one that thank, I, I pray to God is not listened to by the administration is Lindsey Graham. Without Iran, there are no Houthis. The Houthis are completely backed by Iran. I've been saying for six months now, hit Iran. They have oil fields out in the open. They have the um, Revolutionary Guard headquarters you can see from space. Blow it off the map. Just blow it off the map, Lindsay. That won't start a war. I mean, why would it? We're going to go after the literal economic lifeline of a regime, and they're not going to do anything. See, because we've done too many things in the past, and like with these strikes that I think Obama, uh, Biden, and Trump all at some point launched uh, little missile strikes into Syria for alleged violations of one kind or another. And Syria was too weak to do anything about it. So they hated it. They didn't want to do anything. They didn't want that to happen, but they were too powerful, powerless to do anything. But did it change their behavior? Did it change the regime? Did they not still host a lot of uh, anti-American groups in their country? Are our troops not still 
in their country against the, any kind of international law that we claim to follow all the time. Those issues still keep on and they are looking for any chance they can. We keep building up for ourselves all these problems. And now then we're at the precipice where there could be uh, a new, even greater pressure to actually do what some of these guys are suggesting. Because so far we've done some things against some of their proxies. We've done some things against in, in Syria and in Yemen. We haven't done anything in Iran so far. And you know that a lot of guys are just chomping at the bit to be able to make an action like that. And as I said at the outset, some evidence makes it uh, plausible that this was Netanyahu's plan from the beginning, and it remains so now. So while everybody's waiting right now to find out what Iran is going to do, the question is, what will Israel do in response to that? And uh, yesterday, um, uh, President, uh, well, actually, let me, let me back up first of all, because uh, at the uh, uh, funeral services of some of these Iranian generals that were killed, uh, Ayatollah Khomeini, the leader of Iran, said pretty clearly, not pretty clearly, directly, that there would be consequences. When they attack the consulate, it is as if they have attacked our soil, Khomeini said in a speech marking the end of the Muslim holy month of Ramzan. The evil regime made a mistake and must be punished, and it shall be, he added. Despite repeated threats of retaliation from Iranian officials, no attacks have been carried out thus far, with many voices in Iran advocating for caution and strategic patience. Now, that, we're going to come back to that last part of that uh, report there in a second, that many voices in Iran are cautioning for strategic patience. We'll come back to that in just a second. But it appears that there are those in the United States and Israel that don't want any patience and they want action. So, when President Biden was asked if Iran does retaliate and actually hits Israel in response, um, pay attention to what he's about to say here because he's going to give a response. This is yesterday. Uh, and notice it doesn't sound like somebody who may respond against Israel for what Israel did. It makes it sound like it's an attack that could come out of nowhere. We also want to address the Iranian threat to launch a significant, they're threatening to launch a significant attack on Israel. As I told Prime Minister Netanyahu, our commitment to Israel's security against these threats from Iran and its proxies is ironclad. Let me say it again, ironclad. We're going to do all we can to protect Israel's security. Okay, why is it ironclad? I, I know that's heretical to even ask that question, but we're going to ask it here because, after all, we are unintimidated and uncompromised about telling you the truth. And so I'm asking the hard question. Why should it be ironclad in this situation here? Because the only reason we're at this point right now is because Israel chose to violate all the norms of international relations, which have covered decades and world wars and all that. And yet he, they did it anyway. As I specifically pointed out, we have in, uh, information out now that Israel was tracking this general and, and the other people that were in there. So they knew they were going to be in there, which by definition means they could have taken them out outside as they had the 17 previous uh, people that they had assassinated. But instead, they chose to wait until they got into the most uh, honorable place that any country has, which is its sovereign territory, which every nation considers an embassy to strike. So they wanted it to be the most emotional in your face attack. They could have gotten him anywhere else. They could have tracked him out afterwards and gotten him at the airport or whatever, any other place. But they chose that way. Now then we're on the precipice of Iran responding. And if it, if they respond the way we would and the way we did after the, our embassy was bombed, then it's going to be a pretty su substantial thing. Now, it remains to be seen whether they do what we did or not. But it sounds like the stage is being set that if they do what we would do, that we're now ready to join with Israel and go to war. And if you want to, if you're questioning about what do you mean by join Israel, here's what Benjamin Netanyahu said today. So key things that he said there, 
our position is if you harm us, we'll harm you. Now, again, that sounds that sounds reasonable. If you harm me, I'm going to harm you. Except that what's not reasonable is when you're going to harm me because I just punched you in the face. And then you hit me and you're going to go off. Oh, see, we have to hit you back because you hit us. This is going to come as a direct result of what Israel did. Israel has taken the action that could implicate the United States in a war. And as you just saw, there is no shortage of cheerleaders in America for that very issue. There's others in the West as well that would love nothing more than to join in with something like that. Netanyahu makes absolutely plain. The other thing there, he said, you know, we're looking at other sectors. And that means Hezbollah in the north and Lebanon. And that means also Iran, of course. And when he's standing in front of his jet and he's talking about offensive operations, what else do you think he has in mind? So again, you see that Yahoo's own actions, the decision he made to strike the embassy and his standing here now saying that they're ready to, to fight. And clearly he had had this conversation with Biden before who dutifully said, yes, we'll stand ironclad with, with Israel. Even if they launch an offensive op a weapon uh, operation, into Iran, which could spark an all that regional war. So far, Iran has been very calculating. They have, they have tried to thread the needle of trying to remain relevant, of, of, of trying to have a lot of influence in their area. And they definitely don't like Israel. They have, you know, stated that from the beginning. And so they do, like I said, they are a genuine nefarious uh, actor in the area, in the region. But here's what's true. Also, they're a Midland power. They're not that strong. They can't overtly take too much big of action that would draw a response from the United States because they know that if, it, if they got into a direct fight, that they can't win a direct fight of their choosing. So they're choosing not to. They have. That's why they kept it things that are relatively low level, things we can handle. It's annoying. It's a nuisance. But we have shown conclusively since 1979 we can handle it. And it's not going to cause any issues to our national security that we can't handle with our ordinary power. And Iran has not chosen to test that because they know that that's true. So it is foolish then to seek a confrontation because while Iran is not going to seek to go to war with the United States, if compelled to do so, they do have a very potent rocket and missile force with some precision guided weapons that could cause enormous harm in the region. They have uh, a, a, a small navy, but it's composed of a lot of speedboats, which can cause absolute havoc in the Strait of Hormuz. And they absolutely, with sea mines, have the ability to absolutely shut down the Strait of Hormuz and block a, a large portion of the energy uh, flow from the world. And that is going to cause an enormous repercussions economically not just for the global community, but especially from the United States economy, even though we have enough energy right now domestically to take care of our needs. Oil is a global commodity. Our economy is a global economy. Everything depends on all of it working together. And if suddenly one part of it gets shut off, the amount for crude oil everywhere flies through the roof. I mean, that's just basic economics. But there are too many people that don't want to think beyond firing a bunch of missiles like Lindsey Graham doesn't think at all beyond what he's suggesting there about blow up their oil infrastructure. He's thinking it's only going to cause harm to Iran. He's ignorant of what's going to happen to the global economy and to the, the larger oil market. And, and, and he also and Keene and Bolton are all assuming that Iran is just going to always take it, that they're never going to do the things they can. They're never going to use their missile force and they're never going to use their, their grip on the Strait of Hormuz. Maybe that happens. I don't have a crystal ball. I can't reach in and say, I don't know what their tolerance for pain is. I do know that there is a limit to anybody's patience. And as we have seen, even in, in the, has, uh, has the Hamas example, that there can come a point to where you can feel so hopeless or so angry that you take action that an, an analysis, the sober analysis on the floor says is, is pointless, like Hamas actually taking on Israel's military, which they can never compete with. But they did anyway. And the history is filled with opportunities where people who should never have done something that the, the balance of power said they shouldn't take action. And then they did anyway for either miscalculation, stupidity or desperation. 
we don't want to put Iran in a place of desperation to where it acts in ways that are against American national interest. And if the worst happens and they do strike back and this, this spins out of control into a war, here's what's not going to happen. It's not going to be this nice, easy thing like it was with Baghdad in 2003 to where about a month of war, we went in there, cleaned up uh, and, and deposed the, the, the government there. What happened after that? What happened after we deposed Saddam Hussein? Yay, victory. We won the war. And then what? Because of the chaos that resulted, we're still there to this day. Thousands of Americans were killed in the subsequent uh, wars that spawned the insurgency that came after that. That's where al-Qaeda in Iraq came from. That's where ISIS came from. All of that came from this foolish decision to invade in 2003. This situation here has the potential to be far, far worse than what the Iraq situation was in 2003. Because unlike Iraq, Iran actually has some uh, deliverable weapons that can reach out and harm us. And especially that uh, the Gulf of, of Hormuz, uh, Iran didn't have the ability to do that. Iran, uh, Iraq didn't have the ability. Iran does. And if they play those cards because of desperation or foolishness or any other reason, all of a sudden now then we're in a huge problem. Now, here's what we'd be faced with. Do we now mount a ground invasion and, in, and go in and take out Israel, uh, go in and take out the Iranian regime. Because if you don't, if you say, no, we wouldn't do that, really. So you're going to allow them to stay in power. And then they say, you know what? Now then, because you leave us no choice, we're going to escalate our nuclear weapons capacity. And so now we are going for a nuclear weapon because that's the only way that we can keep you guys out from attacking us. According to the CIA, they could produce nuclear weapons, fissile material uh, in a couple of weeks and perhaps a bomb in a couple of months. So where are you going to mount a ground force that can take them out in a couple of months? You, you can't do it. You can bomb them a lot. You can go on this extensive bombing campaign, but you can't get everything because they've already hardened many of their facilities, and it's likely that some would survive. At the most, you're going to set them back. But especially if you leave them in charge because you don't send in a ground force, they're going to continue to rebuild and you're building up future problems for yourself. It's not going to be solved. There is no scenario where the Iran problem is solved or they're defeated. It's just not there. All it's going to do is blow it up and inflame it and set us back who knows how many years uh, and, and cause the deaths of more Americans, get us sucked into a war. And again, if you think there's any shot of the U.S. actually going to war with China over Taiwan or any other reason, then you should be the number one guy in line to say, don't ever do anything. Uh, choose a war against Iran in the Middle East, because that will suck our, our precision guided weapon systems. Uh, it, it will probably damage some of our aircraft and it will definitely divert our, our resources uh, and our, our ammunition stocks and our personnel to focus on something that shouldn't even be on the uh, radar, much less actually active engagements. And it'll come at the expense of anything that may ever happen in, in Europe or that ever may happen in the Indo-Pacific. I obviously argue that we shouldn't get into wars in any of those places either at any point because it's not in our interest to do so. And it's not necessary, neither for our security, for our economic prosperity, all of which are prevented or are helped by not getting into those wars. But in the event that something did happen, this could absolutely sink our boat. Because then we could get into a situation where we could literally lose a major war, not a setback, not an embarrassment like Afghanistan, but actually lose a war. And if you think we can't, then you're part of that group that is has dangerous arrogance in it. Because I assure you, my friend, we can lose a war if we act foolishly and get ourselves into a number of fights that we should have no business getting into. I don't want to get into a war ever because some other country takes actions that sucks us into it. That's for their interest. You bet. Israel says, yeah, I want I'm, I'm tired of dealing with Iran all the time. I want a war, but I want your country to come in here and fight with me. So I'm going to try to draw you in. No, no, I'm not going to be sucked into a war because you want it for your interest. And you're going to use my, the bodies of our soldiers, the dollars of your tax dollars and the, the weapon systems and capabilities of our country's armed forces to do your job. We're not going to do that.
If Israel and Iran get into a war because of actions spawned by Israel, then Israel will have to take care of it. I will do everything in my power, use this channel, anything I have to insist that the president does not go to war on behalf of Israel against Iran. That's not in our, it's, it's, it's inappropriate. And by the way, it won't be Biden's call to make. It'll be the U.S. Congress. The, Biden, Biden will not have the authority to send anything into, into Iran, no matter what. We don't have a, a treaty with Israel, first of all, a defense treaty. And secondly, the Constitution and the 1973 War Powers Act all are exclusively say the president cannot in, use the armed forces unless the U.S., or its armed forces are directly attacked or are about to be attacked by another adversary. He does not have the authorization to, to unilaterally send in on something on behalf of somebody else because they want it. He doesn't have it. So I'll insist that the Constitution be no. The bottom line is here, we must avoid uh, a, a suicidal and, and pointless war it's just going to get a bunch of people killed, isn't going to solve anything, and is going to make matters so much more worse for the United States. Now, as I talked about at the, at the, uh, at the end of that clip with uh, Khomeini, one, one of the things the reporter mentioned in there is that there are many voices in Iran that are saying we need to have strategic patience. Now, that's not saying that they don't want to do anything. They're just saying let's don't basically help out Israel by giving them the causes belli that they want to launch a big attack against us. So as, as hard as it may be for them to do, they, some of them apparently are saying, let's just cool the jets a little bit uh, and bide our time. But they, they never forget. So it's not like that they're not going to do anything. They never forget. And it could be years later before they actually get their revenge, but they'll get it. And that's part of the problem and the issue of the region as well. But isn't it ironic that the one thing that could keep this from escalating into war is a reasonable action by Iran. Let that sink in for a second. We have to nearly hope that the regime in Iran that we talk about all the time about how they're horrible and they're you know moral and you know the Satan and all that kind of mess, strategic patience on their part could prevent this from going into war. And I I it just sounds odd to say out loud, but I hope that the reasonable and strategic patience does prevail in Tehran and that they don't take this action. I, I don't care about them, frankly, and for their benefit. I don't. I care about our benefit. So I hope that they don't do anything foolish because we seem to be really trying hard to do things that are foolish that could get us drawn into a war. We're going to continue to track this situation, I assure you. And when anything does break or if anything does break, you can count on uh, Daniel Davis Deep Dive to bring the latest information and the no kidding uh, genuine analysis of what's going on and what's at stake. And, and hopefully before any of this goes bad, if it, if it moves in that direction, uh, we'll be helping asking you maybe to, to help us, uh, you know, reach out to your, uh, uh, members of Congress or to, to use your social media to spread the word that let's do not get into a war that we don't, that's not of our choosing and that we are not being forced upon us. But uh, we'll we'll leave it for there right now, and, and we'll continue to see how things deploy. Thank you very much for being with us today. Uh, we always value you highly. Uh, I love seeing a lot of you guys in the chat there. Ordinarily, I can read some of it. I hadn't been able to on this episode because I've been looking at the camera all the time. Uh, but I, I see that lots of traffic's going on there. You guys talking amongst yourselves. Uh, we're all in this together. And I know a lot of you have some ideas. We go back and read these uh, later subsequently, by the way. So even if I don't see it on the air, we, we do see a lot of these and we're very grateful for it. I encourage you to keep doing it. Keep liking this so that other people get to see it, share it, uh, subscribe if you haven't already and keep uh, interacting with each other because uh, we like to see we got a lot of regulars that we really enjoy seeing. Uh, thank you very much. And we'll see you on the next episode of Daniel Davis Deep Dive.